Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 3rd of April 2020. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, public health notice. No reason to ban cash. Don't wait. We already have a public bank to invest in a recovery. And Australia's banks are hysterically insisting they're safe. Are they? So we've got a lot on today. Firstly, public health notice. No reason to ban cash. So we've put out a press statement today, pandemic, no excuse to ban cash. What can you say about this? Well, this is actually quite important, but before I give the details, I just want to make a point. We're not, we're not saying this to undermine the concern about public health, right? This is a serious pandemic crisis that we're in. Um, I know there's lots of different theories floating around out there, right? And, and I can assure people the Citizens Party looks at every single one of them, right? And we look for evidence. So don't think we dismiss things lightly, but we haven't seen any evidence for all the different theories. We are taking this crisis on its, on its merits, on its face value. We're starting to know people in Australia who have relatives in places like Italy and the United States who are dying, right? It really brings it home. This is a problem. This is a serious problem. So we're not, we haven't, we're not undermining that at all. However, one of the things that's happened in Australia and probably in other countries is um, retailers have started restricting cash because there was an, a, a, an assumption or a misunderstanding go around that the World Health Organization recommended people stop using cash and only use cards. It has been forcefully contradicted by the World Health Organization. And this is quite important because for a number of reasons. One is um, there's a false sense of security that this has created because the World Health Organization and, and medical experts worry is that if people think that it's cash that's the danger of transmission and not cards, they can just as easily tra get transmission through cards. Mm. The World Health Organization and the experts' position is it's all about personal hygiene. Wash your hands before you do it, after you do any payments, right? Cash is no worse, no more risky than cards, and it's quite surprising how forceful they've been. The Royal Australian Mint has picked up on this, right? And this represents the Australian government, though I don't know if the, if, um, I hope the, the Morrison cabinet's paying attention, to make the point that Australian retailers should not be restricting cash because in the cash ban campaign that we've been involved in, Elisa, as you know, a lot more, it revealed a lot more people in the community use cash than people assumed, right? And in a, at any time, they should not be excluded from being able to transact, especially in a crisis like this. And this is what the Mint has, has put out a statement is concerned about. So these are authoritative statements saying that's, that's a misunderstanding. It was a false report. Unfortunately, the media widely reported the false report about the World Health Organization, and they haven't reported that there's mm. this very emphatic rebuttal, right? But, so we're urging retailers, pay attention to what the, to what the um, Royal Australian Mint is saying, and do not restrict cash. It's all about, everyone should just take precautions on any, everything they do, right? There is, what, there is a sting in the tail though, which is the behavior of banks here. Because as usual, the banks have used this issue, this pandemic, to restrict cash even more off their own bat. And it's the banks who want to ban cash, right? Banning cash, getting rid of cash is good for the banks. Um, they're the ones behind the cash ban while we we're fighting it. They want this, they'll use any excuse. And they are restricting cash severely. I know businesses that have effectively gone bankrupt in the last two weeks because their business is involved in moving cash around, servicing ATMs, etc. And banks are refusing to release the, the, the amounts of cash required to do that using the pandemic as an excuse. That's a fraud. It's based on a false um, uh, representation of the World Health Organization. It hasn't said that. So for those two reasons, because people need to be able to transact in a crisis like this, and because if you ban cash based on this false representation, it creates a false sense of security, mm. and people, you know, people think, oh, you know, a card's better. No, it's not, right? So that's, that's what the authorities are saying. Take it seriously. Do not let the Australian government all the Australian banks get away with a cash ban in this situation. Get our release if you off the website, the CEC's, the Citizens Party's website, and take it and show it to your retailer if they're banning cash. Mm. It's not you don't have to make a huge deal about it with them, right? Because you know people are uh, it's 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 everyone's prerogative to take precautions, but you should point out that 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 if they've heard 
that it was recommended by the authorities, it's false information. Mm, yeah, because some supermarkets, Aldi and others, have started not taking cash at all. And that, yeah. in this particular crisis, can really severely uh, disadvantage people who are in elderly communities, um, disabled people and so forth, which is what the Perth Mint pointed out. And they said, yeah. we urge retailers not to discriminate. The Royal Australian Mint, not the Perth Mint. Yes, sorry. So we'll stop there. We're going to come back and discuss... Uh, the public banking measures necessary to get out of this crisis. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Don't wait. We already have a public bank to invest in a recovery. Now, before we get into the details of that, I wanted to mention the fact that now we have a very serious crisis globally because of the fact that the coronavirus is beginning to hit developing countries. It's beginning to sweep through Africa and that'll get a lot more serious, uh, but also a lot of war zones and countries that are under very intense sanctions. Now, the United Nations head Antonio, Antonio Guterres has called for a suspension of all wars and all sanctions, and Russian President Vladimir Putin has backed that up. There's also been calls from the likes of the Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, who has said, look, you know, it's all well and good for Western countries to close their borders and keep pumping in all this stimulus, but what about us? We don't have public health systems that are up to scratch, and even the Western countries have been severely... Um, you know, in crisis and look, you know, they've got much better systems. We, in Africa, it's even a luxury just to be able to have water to wash your hands, to have soap. Mm. So it is going to get serious now. Good news is that the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development has just put a $2.5 trillion assistance plan up for developing countries, which includes a $1 trillion, this is US dollars, liquidity facility through the International Monetary Fund, cancellation of $1 trillion of debt plus freezing of all other debt and a $500 billion Marshall Plan to revive and rebuild health systems, along with things like capital controls to calm um, the instability of a lot of the, the uh, currencies of developing countries. Now, there's also been a call earlier in the year from President Putin. In January, he called for a summit of the permanent five countries which are on the UN Security Council, that's the US, the UK, Russia, France and China, uh, to discuss looming crises and problems of which there are many, or were many to choose from now. There's one right in the forefront of our view. Uh, that could be convened and has been endorsed by a number of countries to, re to organise a financial reorganisation, including debt forgiveness, a new international development bank to assist developing countries in developing their economies, and a new credit system which involves the forms of national banking that we're about to talk about in sovereign countries, yep. uh, but also capital and currency frameworks to prevent instability um, and to assist countries in trade and so forth. Like a new Bretton Woods system. Exactly, which was all dismantled over the last 30 years. So what I want to do next before we discuss it is to read out a petition that we've begun to circulate this week calling for a national bank. Headline, for national survival, Australia needs a national bank now to the Honourable the Speaker and members of the House of Representatives. This petition of concerned Australians draws to the attention of the House that Australia is in a national emergency facing the combined crisis of a public health threat and economic collapse. The economic crisis, however, is not primarily due to the coronavirus pandemic, but to decades of economic policies that dismantled Australia's industrial capacity and infrastructure, including and especially health care, while inflating a bubble in financial services and real estate. Australia has become extremely dependent on foreign capital and foreign imports, leading to the highest levels of foreign debt and household debt in its history. The economic crisis was therefore inevitable. Its cause is the same reason Australia is ill-equipped to combat the coronavirus pandemic. For national survival, this economic situation must be turned around fast. We therefore ask the House to immediately establish a national bank to finance an emergency economic mobilisation without borrowing from overseas, just as the original Commonwealth Bank, the People's Bank, provided the credit for Australia's miraculous World War II mobilisation that transformed the economy into a productive powerhouse. A national bank would 
harness and direct public credit into long-term nation-building infrastructure projects and a math massive expansion of productive industries, especially immediately in the production of healthcare supplies and equipment, be a vehicle for Australians including superannuation funds to invest in the nation's economic development for a guaranteed long-term return, support the financial system that serves the real economy, not financial speculation, and restore public confidence. And Parliament is actually coming back briefly next week. On Wednesday, Parliament will sit for part of a day to authorise the $130 billion um, economic support package that the Morrison government did. Um, what we're saying, though, is they should be taking this approach, right? The economic support package is this huge amount of money that's going to be borrowed, probably largely from overseas, to put a big chunk of our economy on life support. And the reason why it's got to be on life support, Elisa, is because it's non-essential. And that's the, that's the heart of the problem with Australia's economy. It's not essential, right? This morning on Sunrise, the Prime Minister actually indicated that the conditions we're in now are going to last till at least October or until a vaccine. This is crazy, right? We're trying to keep a, a non-essential economy on life support until then. We should be taking this situation and saying this is the imperative that we have to change the structure of the economy and they need to be acting now to make it much more essential, right? And that means we're going to have to have manufacturing start gearing it up, right? We just drove here and the state government here is taking advantage of the, of the, the lockdown to build the infrastructure that they've been promising, like the, le the level crossing. That makes a lot of sense. You know, those things are essential in a time like this, right? They're, they're, they can do it in a, in a non-intrusive way. Mm -hmm. This should be done across the board. How do you fund it? Well, let me make a couple of points. Um, even if the federal government did its, its 300 billion so far that it's announced, if they, you know, they're going to do it in a totally orthodox way and that's going to bankrupt us forever. Mm. There's some basic things they could do differently though, just really basic things that make it you know, marginally better. So for instance, the 300 billion in bonds they're going to issue to pay for this program so far, only sell them to Australians. Don't sell them overseas, tell them to Australia super funds. At least then the repayments are going to stay in the country. Right now, three quarters of Australia's government bonds are owed overseas. When the government's paying that existing debt, it goes out of the country, right? Just sell them to Australians. Super funds are desperate for secure investments right now. Do something like that. Um, that's something immediately possible. Now that won't solve everything, it would make it marginally better. Much more fundamental, we need a national bank. Now that takes a bit of time to legislate, there's already something we've got there. It's called the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. That's why we say you don't need to wait, mm. right? The, this was set up under Julia Gillard. It's $10 billion earmarked for investing, like a bank, in renewable energy. Expand it, right? Repurpose, recapitalise it to do a lot of investing now into those industries we're going to need. More people should be essential workers. And if we're doing the other things, and I have to say, there are signs that, the, unlike the United States, maybe our government has learned, and there's a lot of things happening at the moment in industrial expansion capacity, right? Way behind the eight ball, but, the, but they're moving in that direction as fast as they can. Good. Do the health stuff. Do the testing. We need fever screening, all this sort of thing to keep the essential workers safe and make sure they're not spreading disease. But once you do that, expand the economy so you're not putting, spending all this dead money on life support of a non-essential economy. And the government can use this vehicle of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation mm. to start making the loans to those industries, to state governments for infrastructure, etc., to make that happen. And the precedent for this, um, that we're discussing taking over this body and commandeering it for you know, building up our economy for the common good, is what President, US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt did uh, when he came into office in 1933, from 1929, from the Great Crash through to when he came in, Herbert Hoover had established the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, but they primarily used it to put money into banks. And they, they were trying were, to bail out banks. And they were claiming, oh, it'll flow through to the yeah. economy, it'll help businesses and so forth. But it actually well, wasn't even any good at bailing out banks, this stupid no, thing. No, no, I mean, they just poured money... Uh, after money, it was a bit like the quantitative easing where yeah. it didn't touch the sides. It just went one, in one end, out the other end like a sieve. And until Roosevelt came in, he actually took over that RFC, that reconstruction. Well, he would never have got the Congress to approve the spending that he wanted to do on building things like the Tennessee Valley Authority and the big infrastructure projects to get people into... They were never going to do that. So there was this existing institution and he said, we're going to use that. Yeah. And they used it beautifully. And he started by 
declaring a bank holiday. So they closed all the banks for a week and they started the process of reorganisation, which took a few years. But within that period of the next few years, not only did they reorganise the banks so that they were solid and stable... Uh, and separated from speculation, with, you know, they passed the Glass-Steagall Glass Act. Glass-Steagall came in, that, right. that's right, in 1933. But they also pumped money into building the infrastructure that they desperately needed to get out of the Depression, which was with a transformative thing. So that's, we'll stop there, we'll take a quick break, we'll come back and talk about the instability in our banking system and how we can begin to rebuild that. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Australia's banks are hysterically insisting they're safe, are they? And I just want to mention uh, up front that you can find out more information on what we've been talking about on the show in our Australian Alert Service. So contact us for a complimentary copy if you haven't already, or contact us if you want to get involved in any other way. So there's been a, a bunch of stories coming out of the press which are insisting that our banks are safe and... And they're curious, Elisa, because um, if they, I would say, if they truly were safe, it would go. It should go without saying, mm. right? And the but fact that they have to state and restate it is. Apra invented this term, coined this term a few years ago, that our banks are unquestionably strong. Think of that word, unquestionably. Don't question it, right? Well, we we've always questioned but then it. Then they've been saying recently they're not expected to be unquestionably strong in you know, all crisis <laughs> circumstances, etc. Um, well, if that's the case, then why are we dealing with these two articles today? Yes, so this first article that came out, Aussie banks are as safe as houses. Well, that's, that's the answer right there. Houses <laughs> aren't safe either. Apartment buildings in particular. <laughs> um, this was by Paul Rickards from Switzer.com. Now, he's a former top dog at CBA. That's what's important about it. Not just that he was Peter Switzer, but he's a former top dog at CBA. And this article referenced us. It stated that in this coronavirus-inspired market mayhem, one of the sillier rumours doing the rounds is that some Aussie banks could be in a bit of trouble. It is amplified by conspiracy theory nuts who point to an obscure change That's in 2018 <laughs> to the legislation governing the banks relating to bail-in provisions. Now, he claims that the so-called bail-in legislation only concerns conversion of hybrid bonds which state in their uh, contracts that they can be bailed in. Well, what he's doing is refuting Bob Butler, who's yeah. the C Citizens Party solicitor's legal analysis about that law, right? But his, his, um, his rationale is completely bogus because he's basically saying, this is the legal analysis I say it's rubbish. What's my proof it's rubbish? The history of Australian banking shows that post-war we've never had any bail-in and, and um, uh, deposits are sacrosanct. That's what, he's, that's what he's saying. Well, deposits aren't as sacred as he thinks, but, um, and he points out that when, whenever a bank has got in trouble post-war, a bigger bank has come and take it over and protected the deposits. What he's ignoring is that in 2009, the G20 said to the Financial Stability Board, come up with a way that in a future crisis we can prop up banks without bailouts. Mm -hmm. And by 2011, the Financial Stability Board had come up with a thing called the Key Attributes of Effective Resolution Regimes, which every member of the G20 signed on to, including Australia, which said bail-in deposits, right? And he's ignoring that. The history of Australian banking is irrelevant mm. to this issue. And the fact that he's come up with such a lame argument um, shows that actually what he's trying to do is propagandise and the question is why. Mm. And he just went through the list of um, various things that they always claim, which we've disproved over many a citizen's report, such as high capital ratios, high level of domestic deposits, which is <laughs> dropping every day, yep. emergency funding facility from the Reserve Bank, which is certainly being stretched to the limit already, the financial claims scheme, which is not even not funded. funded. and not activated. Um, and stress testing was mentioned in another article. There were two ABC articles over the last couple of days that took this subject up. Uh, one was called, Is Your Money Safe in Australian Banks During the Coronavirus Pandemic? And they cited economist Richard Holden from the University of New South Wales, who said, don't withdraw your savings. You're better off just leaving it in the bank. And he said that if they do get into trouble, the financial claim scheme would be activated and your money would be returned to you within a week. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually shocking how their reasoning is so lame because we've done so much work in this area to show that these things are 
not what they claim them to be, as you've just gone through the financial claim scheme, etc. Mm. And but that's if that's if that's all they can cite, then it does make you more worried. And as we mentioned, the financial claim scheme, it's not funded. We made a decision after the financial system inquiry not to have uh, ahead of time funding, but to just tax the banks you know, to get the money back. But during a crisis, there ain't going to be any banks that could put up the funds, that could stump up the money. And the other thing is, as we've seen across Europe and we've documented, you can look at our website, um, in Europe, which has gone through a lot of bail-ins and has had the guarantee yeah. schemes invoked, uh, people were getting back their money, if at all, within three to five years mm. it was taking for, to, for them to be paid back their guaranteed deposits. So um, in any experience worldwide, it has not worked. Uh, now that article also cited Peter Martin from Australian National University saying Australians should keep their money in their bank account. So again, they're almost begging people. And another ABC article was headlined, analysts believe banks can withstand coronavirus shock but high debt level levels leave few buffers and they cited uh, Brian Johnson from US investment bank Jefferies saying banks go bust because they run out of cash and the Australian banks have got a lot of cash a lot more capital than they used to have and they also cited economist Jared Minak saying ultimately the authorities and the RBA will backstop them so we will have banks they are not going to go out of business. So they're protesting a wee bit too much here. Well, that's the th that's the point. These these, um, like I said, if 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 it wasn't an issue, it, it should go without saying. We some of the things they're saying are completely wrong. Like when they say banks have got a lot of cash, ask the people who've tried to pull their money, their cash out of the bank. The banks are putting enormous restrictions on cash, and as I said at the beginning of the show, they're using the coronavirus as cover and say for the, the health aspect of it to restrict access to cash as well, right? And they're trying to deny all this. Now, I'm sure the Reserve Bank in, in, intention is to, is to um, stand behind the banks, whatever that means. But people need to understand that, the, that the, the, the logic they're using to claim the banks are safe is just false. Our banks are riddled with derivatives. They're riddled with... They've got, they've got a virus. It's called mm. speculation, right? Um, the, the nature of those derivatives is unknown. They're highly toxic. All derivatives are toxic, right? Um, they claim there's a difference between hedging and trading. Well, there's a lot of trading derivatives in Australian banks. These are all bets. The bets can go very badly. They go badly in when things happen that are unforeseen. Well, hello, what are we in, right? Um, if you want, the, the, you know, the, we're in a position where they, they're assuming the government will step in and save the banks. The government has already done a big bank bailout. But, you're not, but you, our banks will not be truly safe Elisa, unless we have a Glass-Steagall separation where the side with deposits has nothing to do with the speculation and that is only allowed to do, the, the deposit-taking side of banking is only allowed to do safe stuff. That's how you make banks safe. And if we have a national banking um, institution mm. that can truly stand behind the banks, not as a bailout mechanism, but as, but as ballast in the banking system, which is what the Commonwealth Bank did the, Co the history of the Commonwealth Bank is a great history, and read what it did in, 19, in the Panic of 1914. That was a panic that ripped around the world. Australia, Australia handled it beautifully because the Commonwealth Bank backed up the deposits in all the banks, right? Mm. Um, that and it was a genuine uh, guarantee, not like what they're what, what they're doing here. So, um, don't believe them. We still need the reform. This this crisis is testing the existing structure of the banks as we have it. Mm. And the fact that the public bank that we would establish would siphon credit into rebuilding the real economy, the desperately needed infrastructure, is the only thing that can restore people's confidence. Yeah. And they'll be rushing into the banks, as we saw in 2014, when the Egyptian government announced the Suez 2 program. People were pulling money from under their beds and going to put it in these government bonds because they wanted to participate that and get a good return. Now, we've run out of time. Thanks, Robert. Join us again next week. Thank you.